So the circular tank problem is a related rage problem that really shows how difficult these things can get. So let's work through it. A water tank has the shape of an inverted circular cone. So here's one of those with a base radius of 2. So here is our radius of 2 and a height of 4. So here is our height of 4. If water is being pumped into the tank at a rate of 2 meters cubed per minute, find the rate at which the water level is rising when the water is 3 meters deep. So let's make sure we're visualizing this problem. As we pour water in, the water level is going to start low, but then it's going to rise. It's going to rise. And it's going to rise. And see how this water level H variable is increasing. So actually, there we go. Let's define that variable H. And we can, of course, imagine the water continuing to rise. And you know what? Now that I'm thinking about it, the radius of my water level, in a sense, will be increasing too. So that's just another variable that I envision increasing as we pour more and more water in. And as our sort of water cone, so to speak, gets bigger and bigger. All right, so two variables so far. The, the height of our water cone, h, it's a variable. It continues to change, unlike this height and this radius, which are the overall measurements of our tank. They are constants. And also we have r, the radius of that water cone. And it also continues to increase as well. So I've pretty much gotten all this information well. And the water is being pumped into the tank at a rate of 2 meters cubed per minute. So 2 meters cubed per minute. So if one minute goes by, we're going to have an additional 2 meters cubed of water sitting in here. So what mathematical symbol should I give this? So if one minute of time goes by, the change in volume that happens is 2 meters cubed. So this is a rate. Every minute that goes by, we get 2 additional meters cubed of volume of water. And they're not telling us that we're increasing or decreasing that flow rate. So this right here is a, is a constant for us. It's that constant input flow of water. All right, and find the rate at which the water level is rising when the water is 3 meters deep. So two parts to this sentence here. We have find the rate at which the water level is rising. Okay, well, this variable right here keeps track of how the water level is rising. It gives, in a sense, the position, the height of the, the water level. And they want the rate of this, so they want dh dt. If one minute goes by, what is my change in height in meters of this water level? That's what they want. And then the other part. Find the rate at which the water level is rising when the water is three feet deep. And this is a little bit tricky what they're going, what they're trying to tell us here. So think about it this way. When my, when my cone is empty and that first amount of water starts piling up, that H is going to be increasing quickly. Why? Well, there's not a lot of space for the water to go. So the water quickly starts stacking up. But as we get higher and higher and higher, now the water has a lot more sort of area with which to flatten out and spread itself out. So as, we, as that water level gets higher, 
that height going to be increasing more slowly. So they want to know how fast is that h, is that height, increasing when our water level is at, you know, whatever, say, you know, some certain, certain height, in this case, three meters. So that's why this information matters. It's all part of visualizing the problem. And you'll definitely get better at this with time and practice. And we've already chosen our shape. That was pretty easy. And we've defined our variables. So here's our variable h. I'll put our variable r in here too, just in case we need that. And we want to know how fast is that height increasing with time when, at the instant, that the water level height is 3 meters. Because as we know, the speed here changes depending on what our current water level is. All right, and we've already defined what the question is asking for. So I think we really are ready to do the math. So an equation that describes the shape an equation that incorporates the different stuff we've gathered so far. And what I'm thinking is we'll want the volume equation of a cone. The volume of a cone is one-third times pi times the radius of that cone squared times its height. So now we're going to take the derivative of this equation. And I'm going to take the derivative of this equation with respect to time. After all, we've got dv dt and dh dt running around in the mix here. So taking the derivative of this whole thing with respect to time may get some of these symbols to come out. So the first thing I do is I see that we have two constants here, one-third and pi. These constants can be brought outside the derivative expression. And now we're looking at this. Well, h definitely changes with time. And r changes as, with time as well. We've already talked about as our water cone gets bigger and bigger and bigger, this radius will also be increasing. So this is actually a big problem here. Both this and both this change with time. We can't just, you know, bring our r squared outside. The r squared is not a constant. We can imagine that there's probably some equation out there that gives the radius of the water cone when you put in time or something like that. And of course, the same goes for h. There's got to be some equation out there. So I actually have two equations, two functions of time, getting multiplied by each other. And therefore, I'll have to do the product rule here. So I have r squared, I'll keep this one the same, times the derivative of that h equation. Well, I don't know the h equation, but here is the symbol for its derivative. Plus, I'll keep the h constant. Now we need to take the derivative of the r squared part, and that gets a bit dangerous. Focusing on that r squared, we have a chain rule situation here. Remember, we've got that mystery r is a function of time equation going on here. And that equation is sort of hidden inside that r. So we have an outside equation, the squared part, and an inside equation, so we'll do chain rule derivative of the outside times the derivative of the inside. And since we don't know what that r as a function of time is, we don't really know the derivative, but that's okay. And of course we can't forget that the pi over 3 is out here. 
So we just took the derivative with respect to time of this whole big thing, which means what we've just uncovered is the rate of change of v with respect to time. So we have a couple of unknown quantities here. Let's go through and see if we can figure out values for each one of them. So do we know r? And remember, this is r the variable. It's the idea that as our water cone increases, that radius increases, and of course this height increases. So just don't confuse this green r for the constant radius of the metal tank. This green r is the radius of our water cone. Now they don't tell us this explicitly, but I have this whole vision playing out in my head of that blue water cone increasing as we pour more water in there. And we're trying to analyze this water cone at the instant when the height of the water cone is 3. And I know that as the height of this water cone increases, the radius of this water cone increases in tandem. And I actually, I really noticed that they form this right triangle here, R and H. So here's this right triangle. And unfortunately, I don't have enough information to figure out what R is. I mean, maybe if I had some angle right here, I could do something, but I don't. So I'm looking for more information, something that can allow me to figure out what the radius of this water cone is at the instant that the height of it is 3. And I see this information here, the overall height and radius of the metal tank that's holding our smaller water cone. So let me let me sketch that in here. So we're really looking at sort of a triangular cross section of our overall 3D conical tank here. And I realized that this big side is 4 and this side is 2. So we can use this, we can leverage this information. Let's just pretend that this angle here is some theta. Let's just say that. What I can say is that the tangent of this angle theta will equal. Remember, tangent of an angle, of a right triangle, is the opposite side divided by the adjacent side. So I'm going to write r divided by 3. What I'm doing right here is I'm focusing on this right triangle, the right triangle of the water cone. But I know that this bigger right triangle here shares the same angle theta. So the tangent of theta for that bigger right triangle will equal the opposite, which will be 2, divided by the adjacent, which is going to be 4. So what I have now is a useful expression. 2 over 4 equals r over 3. And what a lot of books and a lot of professors say is that, oh, you know, we have these two triangles here. They're similar triangles, so therefore we can say this. But really, I just like always saying that, oh, the reason we can do this is because of this tangent idea. That's how we can say that, oh, we have similar triangles, so thus we can make this link here. So this is great. I can solve for r here, no problem. And I'll get r is equal to 1.5 meters. So that's great. I know this r, 1.5. So next we have dh dt. And really that's the entire point of this question, to figure out this. So of course we won't have a value for that. Now we have h. And of course, at this instant, we know h is equal to 3. So h will equal 3 meters. We have our r again. That's our 
And then we have dr dt. Well, they don't tell us how quickly the radius is changing as we fill up this water cone. But we can actually use the same equation we created to get this guy. It is true that we put a 3 in here. We did do that. But also remember, this 3 is a variable as well. It's h. Don't forget that this water triangle is going to be increasing with each second. So I can really treat that as the variable h. That tangent of theta argument that we made, it'll still hold. So now since we want dr dt, I'm going to take the derivative with respect to time of both sides of this equation here. And I'm going to do that because I know that doing that will allow me to get dr over dt to come out. So I'm going to take the derivative with respect to time of this left hand side and of this whole right hand side. Now, for the left hand side, this 2 over 4 is just 1 half. Does 1 half change at all as time goes on? No, 1 half will always be 1 half. 2 over 4 will always result in a half. So this quantity here does not change with time. So therefore, this will be a 0. Now on the right hand side, r definitely changes with time. h changes with time. So we really have to do quotient rule here. Because in a sense, we have two equations of time divided by each other. So we have to carry out the quotient rule in taking the derivative of the quantity of r over h. So let's run with our quotient rule here. And the way I think of it is we have the down, the bottom of equation, times the derivative of the up, the top equation, minus the up, the top, times the derivative of the down, the bottom, all over down squared, the bottom equation squared. So this is the derivative of that r over h quantity, but we can't forget that it is all equal to 0. So let me just set this whole thing equal to 0. And here we have a really useful expression. Here is how the radius is changing as time goes on. So let me try to get it by itself. Let me try to solve for it. I can multiply both sides by h squared. It'll eliminate this, and that'll just be a 0. I can add this quantity on both sides of our equation to move it over to the right-hand side. And of course, I can divide by h on both sides. And here we go. Now we have a nice expression for dr over dt in terms of all this stuff. And remember, we know r, that's 1.5. We know h, that is 3. And this is the thing we're trying to figure out anyways. So I'll just plop this whole thing right in here. And now we're in a good spot. This is what we're looking for. And this is what we're looking for. And we got numbers for everything. Looking on the left hand side of my equal sign, I even have a number for this. Remember, if one second goes by, or in this case is one minute goes by, how much volume is changing? Well, that's this right here. We already know that. So this whole thing just becomes two, really. A positive two. Because as time goes on, our volume is increasing. Just make sure when you put these numbers in, you're getting the signs correctly. And there we go. We're pretty much home free. Now it's just a matter of solving, getting this dh over dt by itself. So let me clean this math up a bit. I'll divide this quantity over here. That'll get me 6 over pi. And uh, 
I'll square my 1.5 here and I'll multiply and divide all these guys out. And I get here, I can get a common factor of 4, so I can add 9 over 4 and 18 over 4 together. And that will get me 27 over 4 dh dt. And now I can just multiply both sides by 4 over 27 to get dh over dt by itself. And that will get me dh dt as 24 over 27 pi and the units will be meters per second. For every second our height is increasing by this amount of meters. Actually, I can actually reduce this. 24 is just 3 times 8 27 is just 3 times 9, my 3's cancel, so I'm getting 8 over 9 pi. And if you math that out, that is 0.283 meters for every second. And that is the answer to our question. Yeah, so this is definitely a rocky one. In my opinion, the hardest part of this question is after we took this derivative, when we ended up here. What were we supposed to do with that r? You know, we looked at that r, we looked at the question, the question did not tell us what r was. It's kind of a big jump to do all this triangle work over here. It's kind of a big jump to make. But what I always owe it to is imagining your problem, you know, imagining these numbers sort of growing and shrinking together. That's why it's called related rates. These numbers, these rates are related with each other. As one changes, another changes in synchronization. So if you really have this stuff envisioned in your head, shapes will start to pop out at you, you know? If you're really trying to understand this stuff as you learn engineering, things will just start popping out. So I hope this question made sense. Feel free to ask any questions you may have in the comments.